Um, well, hi everyone. Um, as you can see, my topic for today is modern Objective-C exploitation. Um, before I get started though, just a few words about me. Uh, my name is Neil Archibald, or Nemo, um, and I'm a member of the Phil Manis security group, I guess. Um, also, I'm a security researcher at Acuvant Labs on the vulnerability research team, which is, is pretty cool because it means I get to do this stuff full time, which I'm really grateful for. Um, I've had an interest in Mac OS X, Sys internals, and exploitation for about 13 years or so. So um, back in 2009, I published a paper in frac.org called Abusing the Objective-C Runtime. And basically what this paper did is documented some Objective-C internals and then like illustrated a technique for exploiting dangling Objective-C message send constructs, which, which we'll look at a little bit later. Um, Kind of recently, I noticed people were complaining about the, the paper being out of date, and so I, I felt like I had to like step up and defend my honor and produce some, some new, more, more relevant content. So uh, that's, that's why I'm here. Um, before I get started on the new content, though, I'm going to run through some of the old content and what was in that original paper, just to like put everyone on a baseline. Um, so for, for anyone who's not familiar with Objective-C, it's probably most people here are, but um, it's the language of choice on Mac OS X and iOS right now. Um, they have actually, like Apple have created a language called Swift now, which is sort of aimed at replacing Objective-C, but it, it, it mostly functions as a bridge into the Objective-C APIs anyway, and so I don't imagine that the constructs that I discuss in this talk are gonna go away anytime soon with, with the adoption of Swift. And, and even then, like, I think it's unlikely that most developers will go and port their, co their code bases to, to Swift in the future, so. Um, Objective-C will probably be around for a while. Um, and Objective-C is an ob object-oriented superset of C, and that means that any C code that you write can be compiled with an Objective-C compiler. Um, and Objective-C basically adds Smalltalk-style messaging, so, so allowing method calls in, in C. Um, and you can see the syntax for like calling methods on an object down the bottom. Um, in this case, the, the object foo is instantiated. First, first it's allocated and then initialized, calling the constructor. And, so each of those square bracket syntax are a different method call, right? Um, so just to dive a little deeper, um, Objective-C is pretty confusing when people are first looking to reverse engineer an application that's, that's written in Objective-C, um, because rather than seeing the typical like calls to all the, the API that you expect, you just see a lot of calls to this Objective-C message send function. Um, and Objective-C message send is like used by, by Objective-C um, to, to, to basically proxy calls to, to the method um, that you, you want to invoke, right? Um, the way the function works, uh, down the bottom you can see I'm calling the method bar on an object called foo and passing in one. And what that translates to from the compiler is a call to Ob Objective-C message send, passing in first uh, the receiver, which is the a pointer to the class object on the heap, um, followed by a selector, and the selector is basically a C string, but it's not just any C string, like you can't just make a C string on the stack and pass it into Objective-C message end, because it has to be the C string that was registered with the runtime on module load to uh, indicate that it's gonna be used as a method name. And then after that, the function is variable arguments, so whatever arguments you wanted to pass to the method, I pass it in there. And so this logic diagram kind of shows um, the flow through Objective message send when you're calling a method. Um, so this is actually how it, how it used to work back when the original paper came out, right? Um, so the first step that the, the function does is to retrieve the is a pointer. It's actually, it's actually funny because f for 10 years, um, I, I actually called that the ISA pointer, and it wasn't until I like, was having a conversation with a real uh, uh, Objective-C developer, and I called it the, the ISA pointer, and he's like, the what? Oh, the is a pointer. And I'm like, well, what does that mean? He's like, well, it's like, you know, this is an NS object, so it's, a, it's appointed to the base class, but yeah, 10 years or so of just calling it the wrong thing before that. Um, but anyway, the, the, the method retrieves the is a pointer and then reads a pointer to the cache from it. And uh, this is uh, an allocation on the heap which stores basically all the addresses of methods that have already been called. And so using that cache pointer, they generate an index to, to seek into the cache to find the method that they, they want to invoke, right? Um, and the way they do this, well, um, <laughs> they take the, the selector pointer, so the pointer to the, the string table, and then they shift it to the right by two, and then they, they read a mask from the top of the cache, 
and they apply that mask to the selector shifted, and then that generates an index, and then they simply index into that cache pointer that they read out and compare the, the bytes there to make sure that they equal the, uh, the selector pointer itself. Um, so that's why it has to be a specific C string because um, it's the one that's registered with the runtime and stored in the cache, stored in the class implementation data. Um, and if that selector matches in the cache, they go ahead and pull the, uh, the address of the method out from underneath and call it. Um, otherwise, they increment the index and apply the mask again and repeatedly attempt to find um, a, a match, right? It's kind of a, a hashing algorithm. Um, and so in the paper, I, I talked about a, a concept called a dangling Objective-C message send um, construct. And basically, because of the fact that Objective-C uses this function for a lot of its functionality, so like uh, attribute access is often like, you know, get and set through this or um, just method calls, um, this, this construct happens a lot. Like I, I pretty much haven't seen an Objective-C app that hasn't had a dangling Objective-C message send construct somewhere. Uh, so, so like I use after free, for example, where you know you you have a reference to the heap, but it's been freed, um, and then you call a method on it, you get that dangling construct. Um, a double free is just a call to release twice. So it's basically calling release once, freeing the data, uh, freeing freeing the chunk, and then calling the release method again. So it's it's the same construct. Um, a stack smash, if if there's Objective C object pointers on the stack, then overriding them is going to give you indirect control of yeah, the, uh, the lookup, and even a format bug, which we'll, we'll look at later and has been talked about publicly a bit. And um, you see down the bottom, like, it's really easy to notice when you've hit uh, a dangling Objective-C message thing construct, like, you'll see a crash in the debugger or whatever saying, um, you know, invalid access in Objective-C message stand, and you can quickly tell just from how far into that function it is, like, the type of construct, whether it's, like, an object pointer overflowed or an is a pointer or, or whatever, right? And so the way that, that my paper originally proposed for exploiting this condition um, was to assume that as an attacker we have control of the is a pointer. We have to point that to an allocation that we control. Um, you can see I put an OX 20 byte gap there. It just means nothing in those first 32 bytes are uh, required for this technique to work. So you can sort of like point past it, but it's just there. So it's, uh, you know, like, address, uh, point your is a pointer 32 bytes before the allocation that you control just to not have to worry about that point, but that, that's kind of not important. Um, so, so the way that your controlled memory, like your fake object should be set up, you, you start with your cache pointer and you can just point that straight into the buffer ahead to the mask. Um, and for this technique, I set the mask to zero. The reason I did that was so that any, any selector value that you apply the mask to of zero will give you zero, right? So that means that it'll just use the first entry in the cache. And so then following that, I set up a fake cache entry. And you can see I had to hard code the selective value back then. So the, the um, string pointer, basically, the, the C string pointer. And then follow that with the uh, EIP value that I want to control, right? So dead beef in this case. And uh, when that method is invoked, then it ends up giving you like control of EIP, EIP dead beef. Um, and, and actually, this technique still works and like is, is still kind of valid. Like there are some differences in 64-bit versus 32-bit, um, but yeah. So, so what's the problem? Well, the biggest problem is that EIP is no longer like the instant win that it was. And uh, to illustrate that, in the in the last OSX audit that I did, I actually had like five finished exploits sitting with EIP dead beef, but we didn't end up using any of them. You know final exploit, it wasn't until we had the additional constructs that we could like take it further and win, right? So, which it, it, it kind of hurts me because back in the day it was like EIP was the goal and, and now like, you know, just leaving them <laughs> trash bugs is, is, is painful. Um, the other problem is the mystery of the selector. Um, because of ASLR and a less predictable address space now, then uh, hard coding a selector value doesn't really work. Um, this isn't quite true and with local exploits, um, if, the, if the selector, like the C string, is stored in the shared region, which we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit, you, you can count on the fact that it will be the same address in your process and whatever process you're trying to exploit. And so in that case, the technique is still pretty much how it was back then, and, and there's been some public examples lately of that. But for, for remote exploitation of this construct, it means that you kind of need to have an, an, an information leak to go with the construct to, to finish it off, right? Or, or some other solution. Um, 
And so if you do have just an info leak of the module base that the select is in, then you can just combine that value with the EIP control that it gives you and then wrap into that module to win. Um, the problem is like finding a standalone info leak that's just an info leak by itself is, is, I mean it happens, but it's still pretty rare. And like usually if you're looking for an info leak, you tend to run into things like heap overflows that you would turn into an info leak. And in that case, you don't really need the other construct, right? It's like, it, I think it's, it's, yeah, it's pretty rare to find just like, this is a standalone info leak. Um, so the solution which I'm gonna discuss in this talk is basically to convert this dangling Objective-C message construct into an info leak. And that either we can info leak and use the value that is returned or find a way to execute code without requiring an info leak at all. Um, and the technique that I'm gonna discuss for this differs depending on both the, the architecture and also the, the location of the library containing the selector. Um, and so we'll run through the, the possibilities for that. Okay, so uh, the first like location that we'll look at for the library is the shared region. Um, and so for anyone who doesn't know, the, the shared region is a portion of the address space that's used for commonly loaded libraries on the system, and it's mapped into all the processes on the system so that they can like, you know, save, save physical memory by not having to re, remap uh, every common library in it, every process, right? Um, and basically, there's a file in var db dyld, which is generated when you do a, a software update and libraries are updated. Um, the, basically, they run through all the, uh, a text file that contains a list of all the common libraries and just like cat them together in a randomized order into this file. And then they create a map file that shows the location of each of the modules within that big blob file. And then at, at runtime, that file is, is, as I said, mapped in at a fixed, fixed address. Um, so on 64-bit platforms, there was a slide value that's added to the base, which we'll look at in a little bit. And uh, the slide is a random value that's generated between zero and the amount of space left over in the shared region after that file has been mapped in. Um, and currently, there's 15 bits available, available for that on 64-bit system. So um, the first architecture that we'll look at is 32-bit. Is um, there are still quite a lot of processes on OS X that use 32-bit architecture, which is even on 64-bit box, right? Um, the technique is a little easier and clearer on 32-bit, so that's why I'm gonna start with that and then, and then move on after. Um, so, so for 32-bit processes on OS X currently, they use the old Objective-C runtime, which is identical to what was in my paper. Um, the shared region has no slides, so those 15 bits of randomization just aren't used, and the, the file itself or a structure followed by this, the file itself are mapped in at uh, OX9000000. Um, and while there's no slide, the order of the modules, as I said, is actually randomized in that file, so you can't count on like a certain module being in a certain place within that. You can, you can count on a module starting at like 900C000, but you don't know which one it is, right? Okay, so um, the, the, the way to exploit this condition on a 32-bit process in the shared region is, well, one way is by abusing the mask. So if you remember in the original technique, we set the mask to zero in order to turn it into an index of zero. But rather than doing that, you can use the mask to mask off the unpredictable randomized bits in the selector. So the bits that we can't count on, the bits that we don't know. Um, and then we can use those bits to create an index into our fake object or, or cache array. Um, and basically, by doing that, those, those randomized bits are the index. And so we know that like, the, the element that we've positioned at that index can correlate with the value that we have used, which hopefully will become a little clearer. But d down the bottom, you can see a selected value from my machine from a 32-bit process, so 90F3F863. Uh, and then the bit pattern below. Um, because the shared region starts at OX9, we can count on those bits, so the non-bold bits, um, being static. And then the, the last uh, 12 bits, we can count on being static as well because they're always gonna be the same offset into whatever page um, is, is being indexed there, right? But those middle bits that are highlighted, uh, they're gonna fluctuate based on the randomization of the shared region. And so for a remote exploit, we, we, we have to like use those, right? We have to extract those somehow. So, so the mask value that like corresponds to those bits, if you remember in the, the logic diagram, then the selector is shifted right by two. Um, and so 
we could basically create a mask that accounts for those bits and then shift it two over, and that gives us the mask 3FFFC00. Um, and for the selective value that I had in the previous slide, this would give an index of 3, uh, 3CFC00, which is quite a, a big value, right, obviously. Okay, so um, just, just to go back and iterate a point, just to be clear, um, there's a relationship between the location of the selector and then the text segment, right? The, the selector, as I said, is a C string in the strings uh, table of a, a mocker file in memory, right? So if you have the, the module base of that mocker file and you know the version, then you know where the selector is gonna be within that file, but you also know that relative to that selector, the, the text segment's there. So if, if you have that base and if you're able to leak those bits of randomization and, and count on the base, you can then use ROP in the, in the text segment. Um, so, so as I said, like the, the technique revolves around creating a really large cache entry slide that iterates all permutations of the randomized bits between um, the value like 9000000 and then those last 12 bits of the selector within the module, um, all the way through to 9FFFFF863. Uh, and um, by creating a cache entry in the right place for each of those selected values, um, we, can, we can guarantee that the selector match is gonna succeed and give us EIP control. So, so putting this all together, um, this is just the same kind of thing as, as the initial technique. You, you control the is a pointer of an object, you point it to an allocation you control, or OX20 bytes before it, right? You point the cache pointer um, back into the buffer that you control. Um, but this time we use the mask 3 FFFC0, like, uh, like in that previous slide. And so now, when the index is generated, it indexes into that large table, as you can see. So, so starting off with 900863, it finds the right place in the middle, and then it sets EIP to that location plus the offset. So it drives EIP into a, into a gadget, into a, the text segment of that module. Obviously, you can probably see like this technique revolves around making a really large allocation um, in order to permutate all those, uh, those bits. And it's the size of the buckets array plus the size of all the cache entries on this old runtime. Uh, so currently, the size of the allocation you have to make is 30E4500 bytes, uh, 000 bytes, which is it's pretty big, but it's not too big. Like you can make this allocation from like scripting languages like JavaScript without much problem. Um, also, like because of the size of it and the fact that this is in a 32-bit process, there's a limited amount of space in the address space that they can position this. So you actually find that like it's a really predictable allocation, and you can get it like two out of three times if you do like a, like three or four of these allocations. You can predict the exact address like straight out. Um, the biggest problem that I run into with this though is in things like like WebKit and JavaScript Core. Um, if, if you if you're using JavaScript to create this, you start running into memory pressure bugs, for example. Um, and these are like not exploitable bugs, like often ending in just like a UD2 instruction or something, you know, like a intentional error out, but um, they make exploitation less, less stable, so please if you run into any bugs like this or like null pointed your references and stuff that are po like pointless, just report them to the vendor and get them fixed so that we can get some, some more reliable exploitation. <laughs> okay, so now we've looked at the 32-bit runtime, we'll, we'll look at the 64-bit. Um, it's a little different, so um, for starters, the shared region starts at the address 7FFF80000. Um, as I mentioned before, there is a 15-bit slide value added, so rather than the file being mapped right at the start, it, it's 15 bits in. Um, again, modules are randomized within the shared region, so when that file is created, the order of the modules is random. And uh, it uses a completely new version of the Objective-C runtime, um, which is pretty crazy, like, it, it kind of uses these, these uh, C++ structs instead of, like, real C structs, so they have methods inside them, which is, is pretty strange to read at first. Um, we'll look at how, how the logic differs in 64-bit. In so, so the new runtime, once again, retrieves the is a pointer from the top of the object, um, and then reads the mask out from that location. But you can see, uh, instead of shifting to the right by two, and then applying the mask, it actually shifts it to the left by four, and applies the mask, which is pretty crucial. Um, then it compares again for the selective value, and if the selective value matches, it calls the method. But this time, if it doesn't match, it just, rather than applying the mask again, subtracts the 16 bytes and just walks down the list, right, until it finds a match, or until it finds zero and ends. 
Um, and so, so generally, if it finds zero and ends, it would like consider that a cache miss, and then it would like go back to the class data and look up and resolve. But we we don't need to look at that for for this talk. Um, okay, so the, as I mentioned, like the mass differs by shifting left four instead of right by two, and that means that like to get the bits out of the you know the 64-bit value, we would need the mask of FFFF0000, which is like four gig allocation at least to hold all the data that we need. And even if we were in a position where we can make that allocation, I mean, it's, it's possible, but populating each of those fields from JavaScript or something would take so long, it's just not a feasible approach for a real exploit. But um, as I mentioned, like, there's a little bit of a difference in the way that a miss happens, and it actually like will rather like in a 32-bit version. If you tried to like use the fact that it would increment index each time, it applies the mask each time, and so index kind of just wraps back and it ends up in an endless loop, which is it's kind of handy because you can like point it at a location and then change that address repeatedly until you get a match, but doesn't really allow this technique to work. So, um, so so the alternative approach for 64-bit is to use the mask to seek to the end of a really large cache uh, slide again. And then it'll miss most likely on the, the, the last entry, but then it will iterate backwards through each entry until it finds the right one and then, and then call, right? Um, this kind of sounds easier than it is. Like there's a few little criteria that you have to meet here. Um, so as I mentioned, the offset is the selector shifted left by four and with the mask. Um, obviously, because we need to go to the end and then seek backwards, we need our offset to be greater than or equal to the last cache entry location. Um, and we need, but, but there's a problem because the mask is only 32 bit. Um, so you can see that's a selective value from, from my system. Um, so, so with the mask only being 32 bit, we can only use the, the lower 32 bits of that address as uh, index, right? Um, and the problem there is that like, there's not many static like fixed bits that we can count on to make a reliable index. If we if we use the the randomized bits, you know, we couldn't guarantee that it would make it to the end of the allocation, and we might seek past it depending on what the, the randomized bits are. Um, but luckily, because of the fact that the the shared register starts at seven FFF eight, um, that that eight there is is reachable within our thirty two bit mask. So. Um, so also, if we use the lower bits, you know, as I mentioned, the, the lower 12 bits you can count on because they're an index into a page, but um, they wouldn't be a big enough size to get to the end of our cache, so we can't rely on them either. But luckily, there's this one bit here that you can see in the mask that we can count on, and applying the mask of OX800000 to any selective value um, on a 64 bit system will give you the index 800000, like a huge index. But because we can count on it being that value, we can then point the bucket pointer. OX800000 bytes before the end of the slide, you know? So we, rather than having to actually make an allocation of that size or whatever, we just, we just point it up here in memory so that when it's, it's added to 8000, it seeks to the end, right? And so this is the, the whole technique on 64-bit. Um, you point the is a pointer to the allocation that you control, or in this case, uh, 16 bytes above it. Um, then you point the bucket pointer, as I mentioned, OX8000, 0, 0, 0 bytes above the end of the, the cache slide. And then you just like start, oh, you, you put the mask of 80000 0, 0, 0, 0 that I mentioned, and then uh, just each of the cache entries, uh, starting from 0000 0, 0, 0 all the way to FFF. Um, and basically, for each EIP value, you just like add the same randomized bits, point them to the, so that like when the lookup happens, you, you can count on being at a certain location within the text segment of the module, right? Um, and the cool thing about that is it's a much smaller uh, cache slide than 32-bit. It's like about a four meg allocation, and you can like spray that or leak a heap address in order to get that. Which I mean, there's been a lot of a lot of talk of like timing attacks and stuff to leak heap addresses. It's way more common than leaking a module base. So um, yeah, or, or spray, like I said. Um, so so if the module's not loaded in the shared region, the way it works is. The modules are loaded just simply like straight after the executable file mapping itself. And the position of the executable file is chosen by taking the uh, desired load address from the, the executable and then just adding a randomized value to it, so sliding it. And then they keep the, the linker keeps track of that and then maps each module in afterwards, or after the heap. Um, so you can count on the module load order within the, the Mako headers to, to know like 
it doesn't randomize the order of like the dependencies of an executable when they're loaded, so you can count that to like eliminate bits. But you can see like I've highlighted on a 64-bit platform and on a 32-bit platform, the uh, the X's are the randomized bits. So in an uncommon module on a 32-bit platform, for example, there's only one byte of randomization to guess there, so it's a pretty tiny, tiny allocation. Um, so yeah, to, to summarize like what, what we just went over, like this this allows us to trick the runtime into revealing the random bits in selector, right? And uh, using those random bits, we can gain EIP and, and RIP or RIP control with the slide adjustment that leaves us actually on the executable page in memory, so in, in the text segment. So, so what do we do with that? It kind of gives us one gadget of execution, but um, as like within the exploit context, we don't actually like know, we don't have the address, so what do we do? Um, so with that one gadget, there's a, a few options. Um, there's a million options, but I'll just run through a couple. Um, the first one is to return the selector value. So when Objective C message send hits, like you know, the return statement, the uh, selector value is still left in a register. So uh, like RCX on, on 32-bit, and I don't even remember on 64-bit. <laughs> but uh, if we had returned to a gadget which takes advantage of that, we can possibly retrieve that value, right? So here's an example of like a small gadget that just moves ECX into EAX and then returns. Um, and so if we return to that, if, if, if we use that as a, a single gadget, the, the method call, instead of returning its expected value, will now return the selector. So if, for example, if we were able to retrieve the length and we had a dangling call to length, um, then instead of getting a length back, we'd get a pointer back, right? And uh, that gives us the, the info leak that we can use to, I mean, once you have that base, you just re-trigger the, the bug. Um, but you can't always retrieve the return value of the method, right? Like that's just, it's nice when that happens, but it's, it's not always gonna be the case. So, so another way that you can use this, this kind of construct um, and utilize the fact that the selector's in, in a register is to return to a gadget which writes it into memory. Um, so you could do something like spray a JavaScript array and then return to a gadget which writes to a fixed location in the address space that you've controlled and within your JavaScript thread be polling that, that allocation to, to find a change then when you find the change, you have the selective value and you can re-trigger, right? Same, same kind of concept. So uh, another way to utilize this gadget is to uh, write a self-modifying ROP chain. And this is really, really difficult. Um, I wouldn't have even put this in here because I haven't managed to do this myself, but I have seen friends' exploits use this, which I was, I was pretty impressed with. Um, and basically what, what this means is that you use a single gadget, it has to pivot, and then write using the, uh, or, and then uh, add the ECX register or the, the uh, selector value to a series of additional gadgets. But it's pretty hard to find a single gadget that can give you that kind of control. But uh, I'm just mentioning it because I have, have seen it done and it was really cool. <laughs> and, and obviously like that adjusts your entire ROP chain. So now your ROP chain is relative to the module base and just works, right? And uh, this is probably the most common way that I would go about exploiting this, this construct. And it's just like, find a gadget that lets you do an arbitrary write of a large value to a fixed location that you can get mapped, right? And then you need to position something meaningful in that location in order to take the construct further. And some examples of that, um, if you're looking at this from like a JavaScript perspective or like a language perspective, you, you want to do like length encoded arrays and stuff, so like array buffers, string impulse uh, arrays. Um, and by, by positioning the length field at that location and then writing a large value to it, suddenly you can you know, arbitrarily index all of memory. So um, that's a pretty easy win from there. Um, if you're not talking about a target that has a language construct within it, um, since this is Objective-C, there are native constructs that are length encoded, like NS array and NS mutable array. And so if, if those are used, you can potentially spray those and use those as targets. Um, if not, just any kind of length encoded primitive, um, see this a lot in, in exploitation these days because that read-write primitive is so desired for bypassing security mechanisms, right? Uh, okay, so if you have generated that arbitrary read-write construct, Objective-C is a pretty handy way to, uh, provides a pretty handy way for us to like leverage EIP from that. Um, you, I, I've done this at an exploit, it, it worked pretty well, it was, it was handy. Um, basically, because we have the base of the Objective-C module, we can just walk the Mako uh, headers, we can find the class ref section, and then find the, uh, the cache pointer from that, and like, like the cache is the cache I was talking about earlier with the method calls out on the heap. So once we have our offset to the cache, uh, once we have the address of our cache even, we can just walk to the cache looking for a cell match ourselves, 
and then modify the EIP value stored there. And so like, for example, if there's a, a JavaScript object, like with this an Objective-C object wrapped by a JavaScript object, and we've infected its cache, now by, by calling like whatever method on that JavaScript object accesses the Objective-C one, we can get EIP control, and then you can repeatedly change it to like do what you need, right? Um, okay, so, so that covers like that, that technique. Um, now I'm gonna run over just some of the runtime changes that happened between 2009 and, and kind of now. Um, so the first thing that I found kind of interesting in the runtime was the addition of something called tag pointers. Um, and what tag pointers are, they abuse the fact that the, the default allocator, the memory allocator, uses natural alignment to store data. Uh, store data. So it means that the lower bit of a heap, a heap address is not set, right? Because it's, it's you know, it's, it's natural size. Um, so the runtime uses this by saying that the, the low bit set in an Objective-C object pointer indicates that it's a tag pointer, and a tag pointer, rather than being a real pointer, bits 61 to 63 uh, are used to index into a table of what type the object is, and then the rest of the bits in that 64-bit that pointer are used for the data of the object in line. So instead of having to like have this class allocation and have this like object out on the heap, you just have this one, one small pointer. And you can see the types, NS atom, NS string, NS number, NS index path, NS managed object ID, and NS date. Um, I'll run through some of the interesting ones, but you can, I mean, I'll leave it as an exercise to look through some of the, the other, other examples because they're kind of interesting. Um, the, the first one that's pretty handy, I think, uh, the first in the table is, is NS atom. Um, so at the top you see 0, 1, 1, that's the bit pattern for NS atom. You see the very lower bit, 1, is set indicating that it's a tag pointer. And then the two bits next to it, 0, 1, that's the index into that type table for what, what the is a pointer is for the class, basically. Um, so think about NS Atom. You can call any method name on an NS Atom, and it will return one. It, so typically, if you called like, you know, if you had an NS object and you call like init with UTF-8 string, it, it doesn't have that method. So it throws an exception. It, it errors out, right? Um, so if you're looking at a case where you're trying to overflow some pointer out on the the stack, and you're smashing a bunch of objects to get there. You, you might find that like if that method call happens and you have, weren't able to like replace that object and fake a, a, a you know fake a cache hit and utilize that somehow, um, it's going to crash and you're not going to be able to utilize the the variable that's stored on the stack. But by replacing it with the bit pattern 011, so or just like one, uh, it it results in um, yeah the the method will succeed. Um, and you can see down below, I'm just calling the method init with UTF-8 string while on just one, the value, and NS Adam returns one. And actually, if you call it from context that expects a string, it will just return an empty string too, which is, is kind of handy. So it's, it really is hard to make that crash. So it, it's useful for continuation of execution for, as I said, like replacing objects in an overflow to hit something else. Um, obviously, if it returns one and it was expecting a pointer, it's still maybe going to crash, but it's, it's just one, one way to get, get around that. Okay, so the, the next interesting type that I, I looked at was NS string. Um, the way that a tagged NS string works, the least significant uh, byte is used for the length and the selector, uh, as I mentioned. And then any string that's less than seven bytes is just stored in line. Like, so in the pointer, there's just string data, right? Um, and so the first uh, use of this, this tag scenario that I look at is an untagged NS string, and we are toggling it into a tagged NS string. Um, and so you can see, I create an NS string called X, um, and I init with UTF-8 string hello world. And hello world is obviously bigger than seven bytes, so it's too big for the runtime to make that a tagged NS string. So it creates an allocation on the heap with the contents hello world, and then points this uh, object pointer to it. Um, so now this, this character pointer equaling the address of our object, and then writing to the lower byte of that, is simulating a one byte overflow into a Objective-C pointer. Um, and so by writing the value F5, we are changing, obviously like the value five has the lower bit set, so suddenly this pointer becomes a tag pointer, right? And you can see if I print the length of the string, it prints the F value that we supplied for the length. Um, but then also if we print the contents with NS log X, because it's now a tag pointer and it thinks that the high, upper bits are the contents of the string, it prints them in this case. So if there's a way for you to 
one byte overflow into a, a tagged, uh, untagged NS string, make it tagged, and then retrieve the contents of the NS string, you're actually retrieving a pointer, and so there's an info leak there. Um, it's just a way to turn a one byte overflow into an info leak, right? Um, so now let's look at going the other way. Um, in this case, we allocate an NS string called T, and it's got seven A's in it, right? Um, because it's got only got seven bytes, it is allocated by the runtime as tagged, so the lower bit is set. But again, we simulate a one byte overflow, this time writing zero, so something like a, you know, a, a string, string copy overflow or whatever. One byte, though. Um, so now we print the, the length by calling the length method, which is, which is how Objective-C works. And in this case, because we've toggled it from tag to untag, it now is treating the contents of the string as a pointer that it wants to use to, to find the object data. As you can see, it crashes in Objective-C message send plus 23, looking up the cache pointer from the contents of the string as an address. So if we're able to control the contents of the string prior to doing a one-byte overflow into it like this, we can create the dangling Objective-C message send construct that we talked about at the start of the talk. Uh, okay, so the, uh, the next type that I'll look at is NS number. Um, and as you can imagine, it's, it's pretty similar to NS string. I mean, the, the, con the concept is very similar. Um, a large number, like dead beef feed face in this case, takes up the entire 64-bit value, so there's no way that it can be tagged and stored in, in less bits than that, right? So in this case, by allocating n number with integer dead beef feed face, it results in an untagged uh, NS number being created on the heap containing dead beef feed face. Um, but then we simulate the one byte overwrite, and this time write f7, which is the NS number type, um, and then we NS log its value, and as you can see, instead of coming out with the value dead beef feed face, it comes out with the pointer value of the NS number. Um, so, so again, info leaking. And yeah, so, so that works both directions. I, I thought that I had a slide here, but I, I don't know if I deleted it. Um, if, you, if you create one with a smaller value, you, you do the one byte overflow, make it uh, tag, then you control the is a pointer lookup. Um, so this is actually an area that I need to research. I was planning to do it before this conference, but I've been super busy at work, so hopefully I'll, I'll publish something on it in the near future, or feel free to do some research and hit me up and tell me how it worked out. Um, basically on ARM64 iOS devices, um, they actually implemented a, a similar concept to tag pointers, but for the is a pointer, and you can see like that structure there indicates the bits in the is a pointer and how they're used. And again, the, the bottom bit describes whether or not it's, it's tag or non-pointer. But you can see it has a bunch of things like has C++ detour or like has an extra ref count table. And those things seem pretty interesting to me, like definitely seem like an area I would look out for exploiting this kind of construct. Okay, so um, another thing that was added in between the paper that I did and, and now is automatic reference counting. Um, so automatic reference counting is kind of like garbage collection, but it's done at compile time rather than done at runtime. Um, and so basically, rather than having to track reference counting and like retain and release uh, references for your object, then the compiler will automatically insert those calls into the binary and keep track. Um, and it's it's pretty good. Like it it does definitely mitigate potential use after freeze, but um, lots of libraries are still compiled with this disabled. A lot of developers like had already written that code and don't want to rewrite and remove and replace all their ref counting. So when, when they're calling into libraries with that, like it's, it's, it's harder for that, that to work out. Um, also, all the, all the, even though it mitigates some use after freeze, all the other bug classes are pretty common and like it, it doesn't really change that much, so the, the technique is still pretty valid with Arc. But I've still seen Arc, like, there's been some cases where a programmer, I've been you know, reversing a binary, and, and they've messed up pretty much every situation that I've seen that I've looked for, except like the ref counting is amazing. Like they keep track of the ref count, and I'm like, they, they use the arc there, like it's just, you know. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, like for, format string bugs on Mac OS X um, actually can end up in the dangling Objective-C message send construct as well, which is kind of cool. Um, this was documented publicly years ago by Ilya Van Sprundel, but I'm just going to include it for the talk's sake. Um, so Apple removed the percentage ed um, format string character, which as you know, writes the number of bytes output by the format string to the value on the stack, which is typically how most format string bugs are exploded. So they, they did this to make format string bugs safe, because it's, it's, it's rarely used in real applications, right? 
Um, so that, that's pretty nice, but then they added percentage uh, ampersand, which calls a description method on a pointer on the stack. So rather than just getting a write, you get a nice handy dangling Objective-C message saying construct that you can use for you know, the, the, the technique that we discussed. Um, and so to exploit that kind of, of bug, you can use DPA, like direct parameter access, with the percentage ampersand to control how far you want to index back into the stack. Find a pointer to a large user area that you control, so like any pointer to something on the stack that you control, and then use the percentage ampersand method to trigger the call on that, so it kind of removes a layer of indirection and lets you like call straight into that as an Objective-C object. All right, so uh, another thing that Apple added, um, this is technically not Objective-C runtime. They've actually added blocks to C, but uh, under the covers, it kind of uses the Objective-C structures, so we'll, we'll talk about it anyway. Um, so basically, Apple improved C by adding Lambda functions, and it's got a fairly hideous syntax that you can see here. Um, so that my block uh, returns the number times the modifier, and you can see that uh, the multiplier, and the multiplier is actually stored on the stack outside of the block, so there's mechanism there for copying in from the context that the block's in into the, you know, the block that's executing and, and return the result, right? Um, so at first when I saw blocks, I just kind of assumed that they were, you know, just straight away a, a call to a function that like any normal compiler would generate, but they're actually like quite a bit more complicated than that. Um, so under the covers, they create a fake Objective-C object. Uh, the reason I say fake is because it doesn't use the, the class struct from the Objective-C runtime, it uses this block literal struct. Um, but you can see the first element of the block literal struct, once again, is the is a pointer pointing to the base class. Um, the base class that's used differs depending on the uh, scope of the, the block. So if you declare a block on the stack, the NS concrete stack block type is, is used. Uh, on the heap, the malloc block type. Uh, on the BSS or the data segment or whatever, like the NS concrete global block type is used. And so if you're, if you're like working and exploiting a closed source binary and you want to like find where blocks are used, because maybe you want to like use them, uh, which we'll look at in a little bit, you, you can like cross-reference the base class references, NS concrete stack block, NS malloc block, to look where they're initialized, and then you can like find that the blocks are used, right? Um, and you can see, like, within the block literal stock, the, the main thing that we care about right now, there's the is a pointer, like I said, and an invoke method. So the, the invoke method is the function pointer that's called when you actually call the block, right? Um, and that points to the main body of the block, the main, the main instructions. And so for, for exploitation's sake, um, if you're able to invoke the block, then after overriding the invoke method, obviously you gain control of EIP or RIP. Um, the, the struct that, that I showed can sometimes be stored on the stack, sometimes on the heap, just wherever. So like, it depends on what bug you are, you're working with and like, how you're hitting it on like, how you want to use it. Um, so for the case of a stack smash, you're usually going to overwrite the pointer to the struct rather than like, straight into the struct itself which rather than having that nice overflow, it kind of leaves you with a, a V pointer, C++ V pointer style construct. So I've seen a lot of people like fuzzing and like crash and figure they have a V pointer overwrite because of it and it turns out to be a block because of this. But if, um, you know, if the binary is compiled with SSP and there's a cookie check prior to rat, this could, but if the block's executed and you're smashing into it before that, you can like use it to defeat stack cookies, right? Um, pretty standard. Um, okay, so indexed instance variables um, aren't actually a new feature, but I've recently seen people using them in a way that I hadn't seen before, so I'm just including them. Um, and basically what instance index variables are, so, so Objective-C is really nice for reverse engineering because there's a ton of metadata about, uh, you know, at, at, it's, it's designed to be introspective at, at runtime, so there's a ton of metadata about the classes and methods and stuff that you can just dump out of the binary and quickly get a feel for it. Um, but Index instance variables, the, the concept exists for things like NS array, where you don't actually know the size of the object prior to like making the allocation, the initial allocation. So it's like a way to access uh, dynamically sized objects, right? Um, that, that's its design. So if you dump the, you know, if you dump the, the attributes of the class, you won't actually see the indexed instance variables because they're just like used by indexing past the allocation into this space that's bigger than the base size that you would see from the metadata. Um, and the way I've seen this, this used is actually for hiding private variables, so like for, for like protection schemes of like is registered or whatever, instead of it just being is registered, that'll be like an, an invisible variable. So when you class dump 
um, the, the executable, you just don't see it. Um, but you can actually see in the accessor methods for, for accessing those variables, um, they're, they're named still, right? Because like people aren't obfuscating the names of their methods. So um, you can still like generally work out what they're using these private variables for, even if you can't see them straight away in the cluster. And just by reversing the accessor methods, you can see like, okay, they're indexing the object plus 40. So at 40, there's this variable. I'll just make like a struct in either and sort of just go as normal. So um, yeah, so as I said, like it's kind of new that people are using it to hide their stuff, but uh, it's been around forever. Okay, uh, so I did this talk at Infiltrate um, a few weeks ago. And while I was on stage, I published a frac paper. Um, that's a typo, it should be frac 69, but whatever. Um, so the paper's called Modern Objective-C Exploitation. Um, it covers all the stuff in this talk in, in more detail. Like, per personally for me, I have a really hard time like learning a lot of fine detail from a conference talk, so I, I really love it when people like publish a, a paper at the same time and like I can go and reference it. Um, and just if anyone is looking at doing talks in the future, like um, FRAC does kind of like want to keep doing this for, for other people, so um, keep that in mind, I guess. Um, but yeah, it, if, if you're interested or if you have any questions or anything, yeah, let me know. I think that's it.